We're going to go John 7. We're going to read verse 1 through 24, then I will pray and we will just chit-chat for a minute about life. John 7, verse 1, English Standard Version. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. Verse 4, For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. Verse 10, But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, Where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, He is a good man. Others said, No, he is leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one work, and you all marveled at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it's from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Heavenly Father, uh, here we are this morning, and uh, my mouth, my words, my heart, my mind, they're all yours to do what you will and what you want. And Father, for those here this morning who will to do your will, I pray that you give them the spirit of truth that they can glean uh, what is true and begin to uh, encounter and dismantle the lies within them that, that may have been driving them year after year. It's my God, it's my purpose, my desire to build our self-worth this morning, but to build it in you. But do what you will. Amen. Uh, so, Mark, can I get you to take that cross down? And bring it up here. Um, I realized something during that last song. I need that cross up here. Uh, it should just come down easily because I know this would be a big distraction. Lift up and one screw. Who put this building together? <laughs> Did you? Did you hit a stud? Are you really carrying it like that? Come on. It's laid up against the back wall. I'm just going to so fall over. There we go. Great. Thanks. Good job, Mark. Um, well, he carried his cross for the day. A lot, of, uh, a lot of different veins we can take today in John 7 to arrive at the gospel. Uh, it's a lot. In these 24 verses, I mean, Jesus talks about Jews that want to kill him. He talks about the Feast of the Booths. He talks about his brothers. He had four of them uh, that didn't believe in him. 
Uh, Jesus talks about how to know if teaching is right or if it's wrong. He talks about judging, how to judge rightly. Uh, there's a lot here, a lot of veins that we could follow that would bring us to the gospel. Question for you. you challenge your mind for a minute. What is the main theme of 1 through 24? Now, don't, don't answer out loud. Just let that tickle your mind a little bit. I mean, there's a lot of different ways we can go, but what is the main, the main vein that pulls us all together? And uh, I would like to suggest that it is uh, in verse 8. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. So my suggestion is this. Is that this section shows us that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came in man form, uh, watched every word and every step he took to ensure he would end up hanging on a cross for you. And so Jesus is timing on getting up to this feast, and even the words he says at the feast, when he's teaching, the words that John revealed to us, show us something very significant about the way Jesus views his mission. That it's not important. Not just important, but it is absolutely crucial that he gets there. Let's hold that, let's hold that thought. And um, I'll just, just talk to you about self-worth for a minute. I read uh, maybe 10 years ago that a body, a corpse, in and of itself, without life in it, beyond the, uh, the days that you can take an organ and transplant it, that a corpse, your body, in and of itself, is worth 16 cents. I guess if you add inflation, the cost of living over the past 10 years, and just throw in a few more pennies, we might be worth about 30 cents right now. Any idea how much a bag of topsoil costs? A couple bucks at Walmart. Uh, so according to that article, right or wrong, I don't know, but I found it interesting, uh, we're worth less than dirt. Interesting. Is that how you feel about yourself? Is that the value you place on yourself? You're worthless. I mean, where do you derive your self-worth? It, it can't come within yourself. It can't. Let me show you, let me show you two conclusions as to your self-worth that if you derive of it in and of yourself, where it could lead you. If you've got a low, inadequate self-worth of yourself, uh, this will lead to a, a belief and a behavior that could push you away from people. All right? You see yourself as not valuable. Who would want to hang around with old me? Who would want to be with me? Who would want to be my friend? So you pop on the TV and your life, is a life of loneliness and solitaire. Now, for some of you, you get yourself out into the public and you hang out with people, but on the inside is a lonely life. That will result in behaviors, uh, reactions to that belief that you are worth less than a bag of dirt that will, that will isolate you from people. And you flip that around, and if you've got a bloated view of yourself from who you are and what you've accomplished, it's interesting. The ultimate conclusion can, or the ultimate um, effect can be the same. People don't want to be around you because the arrogance and the pride can be repulsive. John 7 builds, builds value in you if you see the details of Jesus and why he does everything he does. And so we're going to talk about that, and we're going to, we're going to come back to this idea of self-worth. Um, but I was about 15 years old, 
And I struggled with self-worth a lot. I remember when I was in elementary school, at public school, when I was at private school, I quickly acquired the name Teacher's Pet, holier than thou. You know, there are names that in and of themselves, you know, they're just kind of shallow. But as a, as a young man, uh, they, they did some damage. And I remember it was, uh, it was an afternoon. I was uh, locked in my bedroom. I haven't really, I don't think I told this to too many people. Uh, and, I, and I remember a news story I, I just heard of a kid on a school bus who, uh, who was hit with a BB in his temple and just about died. Now, it was interesting because the BB was from another kid who shot at a sign, it ricocheted, went through the bus window and hit him in his temple. I remember that stuck out to me because I was like, well, a BB gun can't really kill anyone, can it? Well, apparently, in the right, in the right spot, it can do some damage. Well, I had my BB gun. You could pump it 10 times. You get max, you know, max velocity. I had it at 11. I had the finger on the trigger. It's kind of just leaning on it like this. I said, God, I don't want to be here no more. On the other side of the bedroom door were people that were just taunting, you know, having fun, but didn't know the extent in which I was receiving it that the, the, uh, the names I've received in life up to that point had already belittled me so low that I had a very low self-worth in myself. And the reason I stand here today is because my afflictions were to tell you that God doesn't put a price tag on your worth. And if there was a price tag, it would be his son hanging on a cross. John 7. Let me dig through John 7. And let's look at details of John 7. I mean, and as I read this, I asked the question a couple times to myself. I said, well, what is in this for me? And as I looked at it, and Jesus' words, Jesus' steps, Jesus is like, I mean, every move Jesus made was for a specific purpose. Let's just walk through this. Uh, verse 1 and verse 2. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. Well, after what? After the feeding of the 5,000. All right, Jesus has this, this uh, talk with this group that wants to make him king. And, uh, and he, send, you know, he eventually says stuff that makes them walk away. So after this scene, uh, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. All right, so how do you handle verse 1? Right, The Jews wanted to kill Jesus, so he's not going down to Judea. Right? In and of itself, it sounds like Jesus is being kind of smart, right? Don't want to die, so I'm going to hang out. I'm going to hang back, fearful of death. you got to read the rest of John 7 to understand that's not what he's thinking. And we'll get to the point of why he hesitates, or he pauses before he goes up to the festival. Look, the festival of booths, let's, let's build context around this. Uh, the festival of booths took place on the seventh month, which would be our July. All right, the, the seventh day of the month through the 14th day of the month. Seven days uh, this festival will take place. Now later on in history, there was an eighth day added to it. It was like a summary day. So... Eventually, this, this, booth, uh, this festival took on eight days in the calendar. My guess is the eighth day was added by people who did not want to go back to work on Monday, but needed to recoup from all the partying. Either way, uh, so it would take place in Jerusalem, and the festival of the booths is just what it sounds like. Ever watch Pumpkin Chunkin? No. Thank you, John. It is a cool show. I mean, this thing is, is growing to be huge. If you, if you, it's on a what, science channel or something. Fire it up, and they got the helicopter view of pumpkin chunk. And it's just how far can you chunk a pumpkin? You know, these guys are throwing them like three quarters of a mile. You know, and, uh, but from the sky, there's just like white canopy tent after white canopy tent, just tents all over the place. The festival booth was similar to that. You would go down to Jerusalem. And you would build yourself a booth out of palm branches or, or olive branches, and you would live in it for seven days. And so these booths would be everywhere. 
And now the, the festival was to celebrate the end of the agriculture year. So everyone gathered their harvest, gathered their crops, and then headed down to Jerusalem to celebrate. The, uh, that's all right, that's the details missing. Every male was required to attend, by the way. Deuteronomy states that every male was required to attend the festival. All right, so just kind of give you a bird's eye view of what this festival was about. There'd be a lot of sacrificing going on, a lot of worship. Uh, so the, now, the Jews fe- the, now, now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. All right, do you have that, do you have that uh, image of the map? Let's see what this looks like. All right, I don't know if you can see that. You see the, uh, the big blue body of water down at the bottom? Okay, you see the little blue body of water at the top? That's the Sea of Galilee. That's, about, that's the Galilee area, the top of the map. The Judea area is down towards the bottom of the map. The distance between the Ga- Galilee, like let's say Capernaum, where we last see Jesus, and Jerusalem to where he's going to head is about 80 to 90 miles. So it's not a short trip. So you would head out two or three days in advance to get there. And uh, most people would take the route down by the Mediterranean Sea or a more easterly route, which would be by the Jordan River, because Samaria lies between Galilee and Judea, and you don't walk through Samaria. Now, there was a road, there was a path through Samaria that you could take that would be quicker, which, uh, which Jesus apparently has taken at some points in his ministry. All right, so just building details around the context so you can understand this booth and uh, what's going on, this, this festival and what's going on. Verse 3, so his brother said to him, how many brothers did he have? Four, great job. So his brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works you're doing. Now, I mean, that sounds like a pretty good suggestion. But John gives us a little bit more insight into what they're thinking. Verse 4, for no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. And then verse 5, for not even his brothers believed in him. So his brothers are egging Jesus, he's the oldest of the five, to get down to Jerusalem to show himself. Now it's up to speculation as to why his brothers were urging him to go if they did not believe in him. But the intent wasn't to glorify the father. It's possible the intent was for family, family reputation, Jesus, you bear the family name. You're the firstborn. Get down there and make us popular. It could have been jealousy. It could have also been, you know, this came to mind this morning. What, what happened with Joseph, where jealousy drove the brothers to drive Joseph away. You just can't, just can't stand to be around him. You know, and that's up to you to decide why his brothers are saying this. Regardless, his brothers are going down to the festival, but they're urging Jesus to go. It's possible also that his brothers knew the Jews wanted to kill him. Just guessing, Jesus spoke to his brothers because they were his brothers. It's possible Jesus shared with them his frustrations, shared with them his, hey, they want to kill me. I don't know. There's something going on in the brothers that's being driven by disbelief to tell Jesus to get to Jerusalem where it's a hostile environment for him to be in. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify, I, because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. I want to just point out a couple things here. What, his time. His time has not yet fully come. To me, it seems pretty clear the time he's talking about is, is the crucifixion, his death. And uh, he knows there's Jews in Jerusalem that want him dead. He says, my time has not yet come. I want you to try to understand 
the fury that were in these guys. Okay, we are talking about a situation that Jesus did about six months, if not a year and a half earlier. Right, what is that situation? It was the invalid being healed. If you go back to the end of John 5, beginning of John 6, we see Jesus healed the invalid at about the time of Passover. Okay, the time of Passover happened at the, the, in the first month, January, 14th day of the month. We're talking about six months, some speculate even a year and a half, this, a year and a half has gone by since this situation. Now, what happened in, in the healing in which Jesus brings up later is that he heals this man on the Sabbath, and he tells the man to get up and take up his bed and walk, and the Jews, the religious leaders, say, hey, you can't do that. And Jesus basically looks him in the eye and says, well, hey, I'm equal with God. I can tell him what I want. I have authority to. And they want to kill him because of that. I mean, guys, it's not like, man, I want to kill you. It's a... The moment I get my chance, you're dead. The fury in these guys is so evident that even six months later, they still want to kill him. And so, the feast, every male's required to attend, they're expecting Jesus to show up. I mean, if he's as, I mean, if he's as close to God as he says, he's, he should be in Jerusalem at the time of the festival. My thought is, well, that's our chance to get them. Did Jesus lie, though? He said, I'm not going to go up at this time. I'm not going up. Did he lie? I got an uh, editorial note at verse 8. You go up to the feast. I am not going up. The editorial note is right after word not. Uh, and it, there is the word yet that is in some translations and not in others. Uh, you go up to the feast. Some, some of your versions may say, I am not yet going up to this feast. And Jesus lied to his brothers by saying he's not going up. Let's just, I mean, just to let you know, the editorial note, in case you missed it. If we pulled that aside and it wasn't in the original manuscript, did Jesus lie to his brothers? Let me just toss out an idea here. If these, these uh, authorities, these religious leaders wanted Jesus dead, they were going to find him through his brothers. So on day one, go up to the brothers, where, where's Jesus? It is, it is my thought that Jesus told them he is not going up so he could pass the message on to them because he's got to come up at a certain time in order to prevent a premature death. Brother said, well, he's not coming up. He's not going to be here. Now, look, I understand that I am speculating to a degree, and I, and I leave that to your interpretation. Uh, as I wrestle with the idea, did Jesus lie to his brothers, I come to the conclusion, well, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Everything he did was to ensure that he made it there. That he was pounded by nails onto a cross by these guys who wanted to kill him because you are worth it. And so, my thought is this. The brothers go without, with the assumption that he's not going to arrive and uh, tell, pass that on to the guys who want to kill him. They put, they're, put, uh, they're put at ease, right? So they go back to the festival. They're not expecting to see Jesus. Did he really go up? Did Jesus really go up to, I mean, did he really go to the festival? Well, he, he ended up in Jerusalem, but we'll see he didn't participate in the festival like it was expected. All right, so let's continue on because this will reveal itself to you. But after this, uh, after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. All right, let's just handle this too. Publicly, so what would happen is, there would be large pilgrimage, pilgrimages, pilgrimages, large groups of people, crowds, walking from Galilee to Jerusalem. And so to go up publicly would be to join the crowd, right? Everyone would basically walk together. I mean, the timing was about the same. You walk at speed, my walk at speed. And so these are, the roads would be filled with people going to Jerusalem. 
And Jesus did not go with the public. He went by himself. And, uh, and it's speculated that he went through Samaria. So after this, uh, he did not go up publicly, but he went up, in, he went up in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? All right, so the Jews, being the religious leaders, are asking, where is Jesus? What is their intent to kill him? They're not looking to shake his hand and ask him how he fed the 5,000. They're not asking how he, he pulled off the, the healing of the invalid. They've got one motive, one purpose, and that's to kill Jesus. Where is he? There was much muttering about him among the people. While some said he's a good man, others said, no, he's leading the people astray. Yet for, the f but yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. Just to understand a little bit more of what these, what these religious authority people were capable of doing, the general public wouldn't even mention Jesus' name to him. That's how hated he was. All right? I mean, we're not talking about just a simple grudge. We're talking about the chief priest, the head honcho, set out to kill the Son of God. You wouldn't mention his name publicly because you would then identify yourself with him. To me, this takes an ironic, kind of humorous twist. Where is the guy? Where is he? Oh, brother's out. Oh, he's not coming up. And then all of a sudden, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began preaching. Began teaching. Oh, there he is. Oh, he's at the temple. Oh, everybody's listening to him right now. All of a sudden, he just appears at the temple teaching. Either Jesus has lost his marbles or he is so set on making it there that his timing is perfect. The Jews, therefore, so all right, he's captured the attention of the general public. The Jews then marveled saying, how is it that this man has learning? Okay, so the Jews here, I believe, is different than the Jews as in the religious leaders because these Jews are absorbing what he's saying. They say this. I mean, like, to me, every word is important here. Listen, my, uh, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? Jesus is getting the crowd to acknowledge something. Whatever he's teaching, he's getting the crowd to acknowledge that he's smart, he's wise, that his teaching is out of this world. And the crowd starts to mutter, starts to talk amongst themselves and say, holy moly, holy cow. Where has this guy gotten his wisdom? He hasn't even studied. And it leads Jesus right where he wants to go in his teaching. To begin to direct his attention to the people who want to kill him. My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God, whether I'm speaking on my own authority. So Jesus keeps the attention on himself, but he brings up the topic of teaching. And he says this. Look, if your will is to do God's will, you will know if my teaching is of God or not. Which leaves, leaves room for, for the, the idea that there are people who teach that are not of God. But he's keeping the attention on himself. I find it interesting that he says, if your will is to do God's will, then you will know. He doesn't say, if you do God's will... He points to an inner desire within a person. That if you have a desire to do my Father's will, you will be able to judge rightly if my teaching is from the Father. And I think he's just talking to the spiritual man, to the new person. That if you are made alive in, in, in the Father, you are called his child, then you can decipher for yourself if Jesus' teaching is of God. Which therefore some would not be able to have that right judgment because their will was not to do the Father's will. But just bringing up the topic of teaching, 
begins to stir the Jewish religious leaders who made their living on teaching. He begins to separate himself also from these guys. The one who speaks on his own authority, see now he's starting to direct his words away from himself and to other people. But the one who seeks the uh, but the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. Another word for glory to help you understand glory is significance. All right, so uh, uh, where was I? The one who's, who speaks on his own authority seeks his own significance. But the one who seeks the significance of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. There's not a single lie. The implications are huge. So the one who's speaking for his own glory is full of lies. Which is interesting. I had a conversation last night with someone about lies. I mean, you don't operate off of lies. You operate off of what you know is true. Let's go back to self-worth for a moment. If you believe, I'm sorry, all right. If you believe you have no self-worth, you will do things out of that belief. If you know that to be true in your mind, you'll operate off of that. But if you know that it's a lie that you are worth about as much as a bag of topsoil, you won't, you won't react and you won't behave based upon that belief system because you know, it's, you know it to be lie, you know, a lie. See, this is how Satan works. If he can get you to believe that a lie is the truth, he knows he's won you over. And Jesus is saying... There is no falsehood in his teaching. Everything he's saying is true. And this has got to be my goal in anyone who steps up on this stage's goal is to reveal the lies so that you can see them and know that the truth is found only through Jesus Christ. Verse 18 again, the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks glory of him who sent him is true and in him there is no falsehood. Has, has not Moses given you the law? These next words just blow my mind. Yet, yet none of you keeps the law. It's not, I mean, he's not going to win the crowds over with saying that. He's talking to a bunch of Jews. And he looks at him and it's like, none of you keep the law. And yet these other Jews, the chief priests, are telling the crowds, you've got to keep the law. To be right with God. Jesus, you don't do it. You don't do it. You all are here trying to uphold the law of Moses because he told you to come to Jerusalem on the uh, seventh month, at the seventh day, and to stay out for seven days. And you're here trying to fulfill the law, but none of you fulfill it. He says, why do you seek to kill me? So now who is he talking to? He's now diverted his attention to those specific people who wanted to kill him, the religious leaders. But he's speaking to the crowd still. The crowd answered him, you have a demon who is seeking to kill you. Jesus doesn't answer their question. He, he does the Jesus answer by going about it. He said, I did one work and you all marveled at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it's from Moses, but from the father, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, in other words, you wound a man on the Sabbath, I mean, you put the guy in pain and agony and you make him spiritually healthy so that the law of Moses may not be broken. Are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So Jesus, he travels back in time and he reopens the wound that he caused in these religious leaders. The one thing that they wanted to kill him about, he goes and opens up that can. Is he crazy? I mean, like, if someone absolutely wanted to kill you, you would probably stay away from them. Or if you found yourself in their presence, you would not go straight to what, you know, the topic that they wanted to kill you about and say, oh, yeah, I did that. That was me. 
and restir all that anger. You've got to understand something about Jesus. His Father and Him, we will get to this, they're so united in nature that everything His Father wants, He wants. His Father wants you. Jesus wants you. He would look eye to eye with his opponents, the people who down in their gut bled murderous thoughts about him and tell them the truth, knowing it would cost him his life, but he did it willfully and joyfully because of you. Now, we're talking the Son of God. You want to talk about self-worth? You want to talk about how, how valuable you are? Look at the price that was paid for you. And not that's just the price, but the journey to get there. And the endeavor and the, uh, to ensure that he would make it all the way. The timing, impeccable. Every word directed at his mission to bleed for you. To have his body broken for you. You see, I, I think about the, uh, the crucifixion. I don't think it's death that scared Jesus. I think it was the idea that he would be separated from his father for a time being. That was the one thing he did not want. I kind of leave us hanging. There's no... <laughs> It's just a lot of facts in these 24 verses. And I can't wait to get to the rest because let me just kind of spoil the end for you of John 7. The crowd goes, look at what he's saying. And the people who want to kill him aren't doing anything about it. Do they know he's the Christ and they're just not saying anything? The chief priest, the head honcho, he starts to rally up a group of officers to arrest him, to kill him. Not to arrest him, to question him, but to kill him. He sends them off, go arrest that man. His time is done. The officers show up. Apparently there's a little powwow. They come back to the chief priest empty-handed, and he goes, where is he? Because, well, you never really heard this guy talk. He basically just talked his way out of being arrested. And then who shows up on the scene? A guy from chapter 3. Who, in, the, in his fear, came by night to talk to Jesus because he was so afraid of his peers. The ones who are ultimately wanting to kill him. Because I need to know what is the way. Jesus says, I'm going to die for you. I'm going to die for the world. And Nicodemus looks in the eyes of Jesus' wannabe killers and says, if you want to be right, then live by your own law. Don't arrest him. Listen to him. And then judge him rightly. You see, if Nicodemus can look Jesus' murderers in the eyes and say, don't you dare arrest the guy. It's at the end of chapter 7, if you want to read ahead. I mean, it's, it's amazing how Nicodemus changes in just a short amount of time. From fear to boldness. Because Nicodemus was, was rooted in his, a self-worth that was found not in those who were around him, but in the Savior of the world. Th th those are going to be incredible passages to dig apart. Nicodemus is such an interesting character, so rooted in religion, who just has a simple question. What must I do? Which he never gets to because Jesus knew his heart. You've got to be born again, buddy. He finds a new birth. I believe, there are people who don't believe it, I believe he found a new birth. And he found it in a way that he can look the chief priest in the eye and, and turn his own law against him. I was sitting in my bedroom, kind of leaning on like the barrel of that BB gun. And, you know, I understand it's a BB gun, right? But it's what I had at, 
at the hand, that, at my disposal at the time to do what my mind wanted to do. Now look, every part of me didn't want to end my life, but there was a massive part of me that said there's just nothing worth living for. And I could remember 15, 20 minutes wrestling with those thoughts. I just don't want to be here anymore. There is no purpose in it. I don't remember what pulled me out of the bedroom. Outside of, I can say, God pulled me out to bring a message of worth to people who the world tells are worthless. Everything that I do, and Mark does, and Wally does, everything that people do here in this church bringing the gospel is, is to tell you something. Is to tell you that there is no price tag big enough that can express how valuable and precious you are to the Father. And there's something about love that can pull people out of the deepest, darkest moments of their life. I ran across this story a week, uh, this week of a young lady who, uh, who made an attempt to end her life. And uh, she, was, she was 17 when she made this attempt. And, I mean, her story's public, uh, so I'm not revealing anything that's in secret. But she, she went on to say what led her down this path was a, was a boyfriend who took advantage of her, who used her body and left her. Now, some of you ladies, you might be able to resonate with that, how you can feel like trash. You feel worthless. And so it cumul accumulated to the thoughts of it's not worth being here anymore. This is what she says. This is to me a testimony of the power of love in and of itself and how much more powerful God's love is for you. It says, I want to let people know that no matter how hard the situation is, this is, this is the girl. Uh, she's 19 at the time of this interview. Cecilia is her name. I want to let people know that no matter how, how hard the situation is, there's somebody there who loves you so much, who wants you here, who thinks about you on a daily basis. As it gets to the darkest point, remember that there will be daylight. Be sure that the daylight will always, always, always come eventually. You just have to brave the dark just for a little bit. And there will be those few who love you so dearly who will be there to brave the dark with you. I wanted to share my story because it was dark for a very long time. And my light was those around me. Uh, as I read that, it just, I mean, I say the power of love. Is that a song? The power of love? It sounds like a song. But like, if, if the world, I don't know those people in her life, who they were, but if they were able to emanate a type of love that can pull her out of the darkest moment of her life, how much more can knowing the Father's love? For a long time, you have possibly been told and you have retold yourself over and over again that you're of no value. What would it do to you to know this morning that you have a father and a God who loves you so much, you're so valuable, that he protected the path of his son all the way to a cross that would be the end of his son, but new life to you? That for a moment in time, for the first moment in time that we know about his son was separ would be separated from him because he wanted to be with you forever. This is what has changed me over the years. It's not the law of Moses. In fact, interesting twist, the more I endeavored to do and obey the law of Moses, the more I felt worthless. But that worth started building when I started realizing how much God really, truly, 
values me. That's my prayer for you this morning. As the band, come, the band comes up, I just want to leave you with that thought. You've got John 7, 1 through 24. Maybe you go home and you reread it again and you read it from a perspective or an angle that Jesus ensured that he would get to the feast at just the right time and say just the right words to continue the journey to the cross. He wasn't afraid of death. His hesitation was him missing the cross and missing you. But he was so interwoven with his father's will that that was never going to happen. You know, I kind of left Mark with this question this week, curious of his perspective. The question I leave with you. How would it change you if you knew that Jesus Christ stood eye to eye, inches away from a man who wanted to kill him? And he told that person what for. He told that person the truth, knowing, knowing at the end of it, he would be dead. And he did it because of you.